Nissan has released its official Nissan Connect application to the Windows Store which is available for download for Windows 10 mobile devices. The app shows you the nearest Nissan support centers on the map, along with the option to monitor the maintenance work done by the specialized staff. Users can also track the trips and access the Nissan community to compare with other users. The app which is connected to the telematic control unit system provides alerts and notifications about the driving model the user is having with the car along with option to access the eco scores and see a set of safe driving trips. If any of our users own any Nissan car and hold a Windows 10 mobile, then the app can be downloaded by clicking the below Windows Store link. Do let us know your first impressions of the application in the comments below. I've been noticing quite a few Seat Atika models on the road over the summer, which is a good indication that Seat has another hit on its hands. The compact crossover has been one of the most anticipated cars of the past year. Seat was late to the SUV crossover game, but is catching up with the Atika and the Arona, a Nissan Juke rival that hit four courts recently. It has also trailed a larger SUV known as the 20V20 concept, which appears to be an upmarket rival to the likes of the Skoda Kodiak. Officially, the Atika is the successor to the Seat Alta, an unimpressive offering that never, to my mind, represented the DNA of the sunny, stylish Seat brand. The Atika is based on the Leon platform, which is itself based on the Golf, Seat being part of the Volkswagen Group, of course. So, in a way you're getting a compact SUV based on a Golf. A tasty offering indeed. It comes in a single body style, with six trim levels, two petrol and three diesel engines and competes with the likes of the Renault Cadre and Kia Sportage. At launch, there were four models available, but that is growing rapidly with the Sporty FR model already on the roads in recent weeks. In a nutshell, the Atika is good-looking, roomy, laden with tons of kit and is a delight to handle thanks to some nice engineering and a lower driving position than you'd find in key competitors like the Ford Kuga. The entry-level S trim is well spatched, including aircon, media system touch 5-inch touch screen with USB and SD connectivity, leather steering wheel and gear knob. There's also split folding rear seats with recline function, 16-inch design alloy wheels and LED daytime running lights. Next stop on the trim level is SE, which is expected to dominate UK sales. It offers dual-zone climate control, heated and folding door mirrors and rear parking sensors. There's also full-link, seats 3-in-1 connectivity solution for smartphones and tablets, together with an upgraded infotainment in the form of media system plus with 8-inch color touchscreen, USB OAN port, 8 speakers and voice control. SE Technology Trim adds a bunch more tech and safety kit, as you'd expect. Jalen's Trim, which was the flagship at launch, included four new innovations for seat at the time. These included a connectivity hub with wireless phone charger which also boosts in-car phone signal. There is a good array of safety aids and systems, including a standard, front assist with city emergency braking and pedestrian protection, plus tiredness recognition. Also featuring across the range RASR traction control, ESC, electronic differential lock, XDS, 7 airbags, hill hold control, and also a tire pressure monitor. Even at launch, the Atika came with a good range of engine choices. There's a frugal 1.6 TDI capable of 65.7 mpg, note, official figures, as well as some pokey 150 picoseconds choices which will return lower figures but be more fun to drive. The 2.0 TDI 190 diesel looks tasty, but is only available on higher range cars. The 4Drive, a 4x4 option, is also on offer with the 2.0 TDI 150 diesel engine unit. Mainstream models cost from £17,990 to £29,990. However, recently the sporty FR model was made available, and if you've the cash and enjoy your driving, this might be the one for you.
FR spec is distinguished from the other models with 4 drive as standard on 2.0 Albanian Lex liter engines, a more muscular exterior design including 18-inch alloys and a more sophisticated interior. It comes with body-hugging sports front seats with Alcantara upholstery and a grippy leather-trimmed steering wheel. The Atika FR range is priced from £24,960 to £30,930. The final Australian-built Toyota Ori large car rolled down the automaker's Altona production line last week ahead of the full closure of the Victorian facility, which also builds a Camry, next month. After 11 years of production the Orion racked up a build tally of 180,000 units across two generations, divided between 110,000 for local consumption with a further 70,000 exported. The first generation Orion was launched at the Melbourne Motor Show in 2006 as a replacement for the aging Avalon sedan, a version of a hand-me-down US design drafted into to duty to give Toyota a competitor for the Holden Commodore in Ford Falcon. The more up-to-date Orion was designed by Toyota's Australian office in Melbourne by the current design chief, Nick Hoggos. Using the Camry V6 as a starting point, the Orion featured unique front sheet metal, with changes to the rear bumper, lights, and boot lid to give it a more substantial appearance. To cap off local production the last Orion was a flagship Prisar a great model finished in crystal pearl white. Rather than being kept as a memento, the last Orion was collected from the Altona plant by a Melbourne-based dealer who will sell the car. The final Orion comes as part of a phased production shutdown for the Altona factory ahead of the Toyota's full withdrawal of local assembly operations with the last locally built Camry hybrid model set for a September production slot before the very last petrol-powdered models roll down the lawn in October. Toyota won't replace the Orion with the next generation model. Instead the imported Camry which is set to arrive in November, will reintroduce a V6 engine option to sell alongside petrol and petrol electric hybrid models. I feel tempted to title this road test of the Toyota Prius PHVG, how the other half live. Because sampling this particular plug-in, part-time electric vehicle became a voyage of discovery, the journey taking two directions. First. The G is a Prius how North America, Europe, and Japan know the petrol-electric toy motor. That means it comes with a proper lithium-ion battery, that plug, and an EV driving mode that might just squish you to work and back without using any soot-producing cold juice. Second, the G is only available here as a second-hand imported vehicle, albeit one that is sold under the trustworthy customer service umbrella of Toyota New Zealand Signature Class range. Which means I'm really taking one for the readership team here. Normally, when I see a test vehicle equipped with monsoon shields and an unsubstantiated number of kilometers on the Odo, I run a mile to the nearest luxury car dealership and replace that second-hand vehicle test booking with one of their new demo cars. But personal curiosity overcame pride in this instance. For I've always seen the nub of a good idea within the Prius concept. It was always the execution of that idea that has inspired so much angst on my part in the past. For example, why did Toyota make the hybrid look so different to the other cars in the showroom? Surely, it was so other motorists would instantly acknowledge the green hallowed piety of the early adopters of the Prius. It was therefore a no-brainer for me to begin hailing the car as the Pius. And why fit the NZ new Prius with such inefficient nickel metal hydride batteries, a practice that continues today even though the car is now into its fourth generation? Such obsolete energy storage made it almost obligatory for me to call the NZ spec Prius out for not being as environmentally friendly as it could be. The 20th century battery tech made the car nothing more than a mobile billboard to show how much its owners care about the planet. But let's not kid ourselves, okay? Driving a NZ market Prius is like a delegation from forest and bird flying business class to some conference on rainforest logging in far off Brazil. It's talking the talk, but is it really walking the walk? Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, 
there has been another priest for at least five years now. And it's good, good enough to have earned a capital G in its model nomenclature. Like the latest NZ model, the G has proper fully independent suspension and the highly rigid platform provides sturdy foundations for its steering and bump compliance. It also still looks like something that aliens would arrive on Earth in. But there are crucial differences in equipment fit out, battery spec, and the fuel saving thing that you can do with it when you get it home. For it comes with said plug, and connecting it to the house supply for a couple of hours will allow you drive a claim 26 kilometers over the following day without emitting any toxic hydrocarbons. Admittedly, I only got to drive 18 kilometers between recharges in the EV mode because of the steep hill I live on, but this is definitely something that adds a little righteousness to balance the usual piety of driving a Prius. It's the lithium-ion battery of the G that enables it to be plugged in at times when it's not in use and stock up on more energy to drive emission-free. Nickel-metal hydride batteries have a memory effect that would make this practice impractical. You probably remember the days when it was best to let the battery of your mobile phone completely run down before recharging it. That's because the NIMH battery inside it would only accept a partial recharge if there was a residual amount of energy still inside it. What's more, a lithium-ion battery can be charged more quickly and efficiently. These are two reasons that it's worth investing in the shares of lithium mining companies at present. It's rapidly becoming one of the most desired elements on the periodic table as our electrically driven future comes further into view. There is a lot more driver engagement when driving a plug-in Prius rather than its cordless NZ spec cousin. That's because the former introduces a competitive element when you experiment with how far you can drive it without using any petrol. Momentum becomes as precious as that flaky white metallic element in the battery. The EV mode of the G can be instantly swapped for the hybrid mode, and it's the better mode for highway speeds, reserving power in the EV setting to handle urban applications. Used thus, it is probably possible to drive the G for more than a month without any need to refuel it with petrol. These second-hand plug-in Prius models usually have a modest number of kilometers on the Odo, 15,000 in this instance, and the G-Spec is equipped like the range leader that it is. That means you'll pay around $35,000 for one that's been refreshed by the Signature Class facility in Thames, where it also receives a NZ-compatible audio system. Driving one is a great way to find out how Prius owners in the Northern Hemisphere live.